<laughs> Great. We are delighted you could join us on this important occasion for our nation's babies and families. I am Myra Jones Taylor, Chief Policy Officer at Zero to Three, and it is my great honor to welcome you to a very special delivery, the release of the State of Babies Yearbook 2019. I want to extend a very warm welcome to those of you who are live streaming us this morning, including my mother out in California. We know that each of the 12 million infants and toddlers in the United States is born with unlimited potential. Potential that as a nation we must support if we are to have a strong future. But how well are our babies doing? That is a question that started us on the journey that led us to, here, to where we are here today. The State of Babies Yearbook is an annual look at how our babies are doing across the country. And this has been a dream of ours at Zero to Three for quite a few years. To make it a reality, we joined forces with Child Trends, who brought their extensive research and data expertise, as well as their own experience in examining how infants and toddlers are doing across this country and in communities. The result is what you are going to see today, a look at toddler, infants and toddlers nationally and in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. We have a packed agenda, and I'm going to introduce our, introduce our amazing moderator in just a moment. But first, I want to say thank you to some very special people in the room. First, the leaders of our two organizations, Carol Emig, Executive Director of Child Trends, and Matthew Melmid, Executive Director of Zero to Three. We could not have pulled this off without your leadership. Thank you. I also want to thank the team of staff from Zero to Three and Child Trends, especially Kim Keating and Sarah Daly, who are amazing leaders of all this. Together, we have worked mightily to distill a collection of data as vast as our nation. We also have a special group of advocates in the audience who came from some 20 states to be here for the release and unveiling of, state of the State of Babies Yearbook, and then prepare to take it back to their states to spark action for infants, toddlers, and their families. And Zero to Three could not ask for better supporters of this effort than Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Perigee Fund. We are honored to work with them in this development, the development of this State of Babies Yearbook, as well as in our Think Babies campaign. You'll be hearing from Jamie Bissell of RWJF in just a few minutes. And I'd also like to acknowledge Becca Graves, the Director of Strategic Investment at the Perigee Fund, who is here today. And I don't see her, but I know she's here. Thank you, Becca, for your partnership, and we're so thrilled to have you here today. And now I want to introduce our moderator for the day, Jonathan Cohn, whom many of you know for his insightful reporting over the years on health and many issues, including child care. Jonathan is a senior national correspondent at the Huffington Post, where he writes about politics and policy with a focus on social welfare and particularly health care. His extensive experience with a variety of publications has earned him numerous awards and a reputation for having a strong grasp of the issues in which he writes. So we are very grateful that Jonathan could join us and share his depth of knowledge to guide our program. Thank you, Jonathan. Come on up. Uh, thank you, uh, Myra. Thank you uh, to Zero to Three. Um, uh, this is an honor to be here and uh, well-timed. Uh, you know, last year uh, I was working, I was covering a, a bill in Congress, and I remember speaking with a uh, congressional staffer who was uh, explaining the thinking of this bill behind me and was going on uh, about the brain science of early childhood and how much was understood about that and the connections to policy. And I thought about how remarkable that was. Because when I first started writing about the issues related to early childhood 10, 15 years ago, the brain science was out there, but very few people knew about it. Um, and now we're at a point where I think uh, most, it is widely understood within the world of uh, policy and politics that the first three years are a critical uh, period for life and that policymakers have a chance uh, to uh, reach children at that point and have profound effects uh, for the rest of their lives. Um, uh, 
the challenge is, you know, what comes next? What do you do? And the yearbook, which you're going to hear about in a little bit, uh, is a chance to, to get a much uh, more finely grained sense of where we are as a country, uh, where we are uh, state uh, by state, uh, and the kind of uh, detailed data we haven't seen before. Um, uh, but we do have a very big agenda today. Uh, in a little while, uh, are we, do we have our, okay. Um, <laughs> We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we'll, we will shuffle things around a little bit, uh, but we do have a very big agenda. Uh, uh, in a little while, Myra will be back up here. She'll be giving the state yearbook uh, and uh, the big reveal of the day. And then after that, we have uh, three state officials here, uh, three officials from different states around the country um, who are going to speak uh, about uh, uh, what is happening in their states, the efforts they've undertaken, and. Uh, both to talk about their experiences, what they've confronted, but also to talk about what kind of lessons can be drawn from their, uh, uh, from their experiences and what other states can learn. Um, we do, before that though, have a series of uh, fascinating speakers, who, two of whom will be here soon, I think. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna go right ahead uh, to Jamie Bussell. Uh, from the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation, uh, Senior uh, Program Officer. In her role, Jamie provides strategic leadership in developing the Foundation's approach to supporting a healthy childhood, including in the earliest years. And uh, Jamie, where, where is Jamie? There's Jamie, okay, I knew Jamie was here somewhere. Uh, if you wanna come on up now, and we're gonna have you, you get the honor of going first. Good morning. Thanks so much, Jonathan and Myra. I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of the Robert Wood Johnston Foundation, advocating for the health and success and well being of mothers and children is really what drives me both personally and professionally. So, being in a room with colleagues, partners, and friends who share that same passion is certainly a pretty awesome way to start your day. At the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, our work is rooted in the belief that every child deserves to lead the best, healthiest, happiest life possible. And Zero to Three's commitment to making every baby a national priority reflects that very same value. So I have almost two middle school aged daughters, which is hard to believe, and which has certainly felt like a very sensitive, complicated life stage. But when they were babies, I remember every new change and every bit of progress felt so profound, and that's because it was. The earliest years of our children's lives, when they're first exposed to the world, are some of the most important. This is because brain development and early connections start early. A baby's brain develops faster between birth and the age of three than at any other point in their life. And these early experiences really do lay the foundation for how a child learns and grows throughout their lifetime. We all want what's best for our children. Every parent shares that sentiment, but we cannot do it alone. At the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we have made considerable investments to learn what families need to ensure that all children have the building blocks for lifelong health. Through this process, we know that all parents need consistent, reliable policies that support our babies and help them get off to the best start possible. This includes access to high quality health care. It includes access to high quality affordable child care. It includes nutritious foods and opportunities to be physically active. It also means supporting parents and caregivers who have experienced trauma so that they're better equipped to help the children in their lives who may have also experienced traumatic events. And it means providing more parents and more caregivers with enough paid family leave so children can bond with the loving adults in their lives. We can think of all of this as a recipe for what it means to give all kids a healthy start to life and to ensure that all children and families can thrive. 
And zero to three's State of Babies Yearbook is an essential ingredient. It provides us with a comprehensive, evidence-based picture of the well-being of our country's babies on both a national and state level. So we know where we're doing well and where we have um, room to grow and improve. And that state piece is so important because it shows us that place matters when it comes to shaping our opportunities to be healthy. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So just over in Maryland, in a rural part of the state, you can find Garrett County. Garrett is home to some of the most beautiful Appalachian countryside in our nation. It's also an extremely depressed area where the child poverty rate is 19%. Compare this with the more affluent Montgomery County, whose child poverty rate is 11%, or the state of Maryland, whose child poverty rate is 14%. So that means that Garrett County's babies do not have the same resources or opportunities as babies born just a few hours away or closer. So this close-knit community decided that they had to find a way to address their challenges and bridge the divide. One of the many initiatives that the county started is a program called Two Generations at a Time, which is designed to simultaneously promote the health and well-being of parents and babies. Through this effort, moms like Sonia Kay and her toddler daughter, Catherine Ann, meet regularly with a visiting nurse who monitors Catherine Ann's physical and emotional development while also helping Sonia meet personal goals like finishing her high school diploma. Garrett County is just one of the many stories that drive home the reality that where families live can mean vastly different opportunities and outcomes for their health. Newborn bonding time between babies and caregivers, early childhood education, even the safety and stability of housing. The yearbook highlights differences on a state-by-state -state level, so we have a detailed picture of why, for example, Montana's babies are faring so much better than states adjacent to Montana. So with this type of data, policymakers, advocates, community leaders, caregivers, parents, the public, can work together, just like Garrett County's done, to target solutions that will give all babies and families the tools and supports that help them build healthy, productive lives. And that is so important to us at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation because we are working on a bold, ambitious, audacious goal of building a culture of health in this country. And for us, that means that this is a place where everyone, no matter who you are, where you live, how much money your parents make, the color of your skin, where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to live the best, healthiest life possible. That means working with communities to make sure that no baby starts and stays behind because of where they live, and they all have what they need to be as healthy as possible. Zero to three State of Babies Yearbook is fundamental to this effort, and in many ways, we hope will serve as a roadmap to ensuring that all our families are surrounded by policies, programs, supports, resources that help them get their babies off to the best possible start. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, it is now my great pleasure uh, to introduce somebody who I think most of you know. Uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut has worked tirelessly, uh, that's her right there, in case you didn't notice, uh, her career, whole career to improve the... See, now you get two applause, so that works out nicely. Um, uh, tirelessly, her whole career to improve the outlook uh, for children and families, championing issues from paid time off for family needs, uh, to uh, helping families with young children better make ends meet. Uh, ten uh, years ago, she uh, helped found, co-founded the Congressional Baby Caucus, which is actually not a caucus for members of Congress who act like babies. It's actually a 
caucus. I'm not the first person to make that joke, right? I, mean, that's, um, I should add that the co-founder of that caucus, uh, uh, Denny Rayburg, a former congressman from Montana, is here somewhere. Back there, hello. And uh, Congresswoman Deloro is here to tell us what uh, having this data about uh, the state of babies in America can help us do as policymakers. So, Congresswoman. Thank you so much. Uh, wow, it's wonderful to come and be with this, uh, uh, with this group. I, th I thank you profusely at the outset for the great works that you're doing and for really making a difference. Uh, in the lives of our babies, of our infants, of our toddlers, and it's your commitment uh, every day uh, that is inspiring uh, to all of us uh, to make sure that we are promoting the kinds of public policy initiatives that reinforce and help you to do your job. I, I want to give a, a shout out to uh, my colleague, uh, Congressman Denny Reberg, who, uh, where we pioneered this effort in terms of the Baby Caucus. Uh, low those many years ago, and uh, uh, you know we're we're still in business, Denny. I need to talk to you about uh, uh, about talking to your colleagues um, about getting engaged and getting involved with uh, with what with what we're doing. And um, so it, to all of you, and to you, Myra and Jonathan, and uh, the host of folks who are here, uh, I want to just say a thank you uh, to Zero to Three and Child Trends for what is critical efforts your advocacy, your research, and it's all about America's infants and toddlers. Yes, where we need to start. I also want to recognize Commissioner Bremby. I don't where, where are you? Oh, there he's right there, right, okay. Connecticut's Department of Social Services. Connecticut is a leader uh, with respect to investing in our children. And thank you, because it's uh, in no small part due to the great work uh, that you have done, and we're grateful. Uh, there. I'm very, very proud of the state of Connecticut. I didn't get the chance to see the senator, uh, but uh, you, you know, uh, we, our, our chambers, our parties, and our homes may seem uh, far apart. New Haven and Bozeman is certainly, you know, uh, not in uh, shouting distance, uh, uh, but the senator and I are side by side on the importance of public policies that give our children the best chance at a better life. And that's what this is about. It is a pleasure to be here for what is the inaugural release of the State of Babies Yearbook 2019. Um, I appreciate the care um, that Zero to Three and the Child Trends have taken. And what have they done here? What they've done is to bring us a comprehensive look at how our babies are doing across America. Uh, and it fills the gap in understanding what is going on um, uh, with the youngest uh, who are among us. Uh, so it's vital information, it's vital data to help us to try to move forward. We're here because we know how important um, a child's formative years are. Study after study after study. You know, I, I've often said, and some of you in this room have heard me say this, we have so many studies that sh show about the early emotional connections, nurturing relationships, and how significant they are and determinative for our kids, that if we do not pay attention to this data uh, and just mouth it, then we ought to be liable uh, for not doing the job that we are supposed to be doing. Uh, we don't need any more studies. We need the data and the information that you've provided to tell us where the gaps are and how we can employ the information. Hi, Lib. How are you? Good to see you, Libby Doggett. <laughs> Good to see you. You know, the, 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 you know how, how it's, it's the relationships early on. Um, many of us in, in this room are grandparents. You know, I see it in my own grandchildren. You play with them, you read with them. Uh, you, 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 you just understand what environment means and what that engagement with them means in terms of, of, their, of their growth. And we cherish those moments. And that's true of everyone. And some people just don't have the advantages that we have. 
in being able to provide these nurturing relationships. Our kids will be okay. You know, our grandkids will be okay, but so many children will not be okay unless we do what you are charging us to do. Um, I understand all of this uh, as a, a co-chair of the Congressional Baby Caucus, as chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee, um, which funds our education, our health priorities. I would be less than honest if I didn't say, yay, I'm excited about being the chair of the subcommittee. Um, uh, we know about how formative a child's relationships are. Uh, the right, right environment is critical. Um, the first, um, we, we need, as I say, it, it is about what we do foundationally for our youngsters. Which, what are the ingredients that go in to allowing them to be able to, to thrive? Um, and, you, you know, the thing I also know is, uh, and we, we have to keep doing it over and over and over again, how little awareness policy makers have of the situation of our uh, youngest children. Um, so, this, so they, they, they get overlooked so many times in our debate, which is why our nation's early childhood development programs, Head Start Child Care, the development block grants, and nutrition assistance are so critical. And proud to fight alongside with all of you uh, for, the, uh, for their success. Um, it is critical that we understand, what did I do? There it goes. It's critical that we understand how they are doing. We know there's a lot of variation in geography, in ethnicity, with regard to outcome. Um, and this is why we must align state and federal policies with data collection and transparency. And this inaugural report, the State of Babies Yearbook, can help us to fill that gap. We cannot know where we should be improving and investing if we do not know uh, where we are excelling or where we are lagging. Um, I cannot speak about any of the specifics. I've had a sneak peek at the data. I can't tell you what it shows. Uh, but you are in, I will tell you, for an eye-opener. Uh, we have made some progress, um, but a few in, in Congress have focused on where uh, our babies uh, 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 stand uh, in relationship uh, uh, nationwide. Even in states that are doing well, we can be doing better. Um, and I say that about my state of Connecticut, and I talked about the commissioner for the strides that we have made, um, and that uh, uh, families uh, are struggling in certain parts of our state, so we have to do uh, better for them. Let me just, um, President Lyndon Johnson said at the uh, signing ceremony for Head Start, our aim must be, quote, to make certain that poverty's children would not be forevermore poverty's captives. So speaking of Head Start, the father of Head Start and the pride of New Haven passed away earlier this month. What an unbelievable loss. Uh, Ed Ziegler's legacy is indelible, as is the impact he's had on the future of millions of children in our nation. It goes without saying um, that without his work, shepherding Head Start, the formation of the Yale Child Study Center. He was responsible for helping to bring these entities into existence. Our country would be less without the work that he did. He said uh, famously, and I quote, if every child is a national resource, then every child's welfare is a national responsibility. And I would add a national priority. So let us heed this report. What you're going to hear is important because the foundations of our future are being laid now. They are shaped by how healthy our babies are, the ability of their families to overcome the stresses of life today. And if we don't pay attention to what's going on in their families, then we don't care what is happening to these babies. Their families are critical, and they're being able uh, to survive and thrive. Uh, and the way we nurture the learning of our infants and to toddlers. So let us take the areas of strength as a national source of pride and a roadmap for expansion, and let us take the areas of weakness as a call to action. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me to be.
part of this morning's presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. God bless. Thanks for what you do. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, Senator Steve Daines. Uh, Senator Daines, a father and grandfather, uh, previously brought his insights to the Zero to Three briefing on what millennial dads want. Uh, he has been a leader on the need to reform child welfare services for Montana's children and children around the country to address the impacts of substance use and mental health needs on families. He's also introduced legislation to protect children after disaster strike. Uh, today we will hear his perspective on what policymakers can learn uh, from the State of the Babies hand, uh, yearbook, uh, Senator Daines. Well, good morning and thank you. This is uh, not a theoretical conversation for me. As I uh, just mentioned, uh, we became grandparents for the first time here on January 23rd. And uh, we have raised four children, and it's a lot of fun now to start helping out with this first grandchild. So Emma Ray Danes was born January 23rd in Denver to our son David and his great wife Maddie. Danes. And so as I think about these issues, it brings it back home and you have a chance to go through this process yet another time as a grandparent. We we're pleased to see in the report that Montana actually fared well overall in the top quartile. And when you start peeling it back and looking at the details behind that, one of the important reasons and one of the areas that Montana scored well was, about, was the fact that parents are reading to their children reading to these little babies. And uh, that's something that uh, I'm really pleased to see because as a parent raising our four children, we can tend to be consumed by these and through social media, and social media is a wonderful tool, but uh, sometimes it's time to shut the phone off and just have that quiet time and read to our children. <laughs> um, it's also mentioned in fact, over the last week, we had a recess, and I was traveling all over the state of Montana. And uh, you, you hear the great stories of the, the healthy families that are understanding the importance of nutrition, understanding the importance of mental health, you know, these strong family units here raising these children. Those are the happy stories that we like to talk about. We also have the challenging stories across our country and across Montana of where nutrition breaks down, family breaks down, addictions come into play, spending time in NICU units in Montana, where these little ones here are coming out addicted to meth because uh, mom had an addiction issue. The good news is, in fact, we just moved through a bill in this last Congress, and I, I asked to add a provision to it as we look at recovery in helping these moms who are dealing with addiction issues. And, and we're grateful they're dealing with them. There's these wonderful counselors and health professors who are helping these moms sometimes break generational chains to get on a better path. But the fact that now we have a provision in the law that, that incentivizes keeping these babies with their moms when they're going through their treatment. We're finding out it's much more beneficial to mom under supervision and of course, much more beneficial to the babies and the children as well. It gives the moms that renewed hope around why they're going through this. To go through one of the recovery centers in Billings, Montana, in fact, it's the hometown of uh, Congressman Denny Reberg, who's in the back there. Uh, we have a facility called Rimrock, wonderful facility. And to walk in that facility last week and to see cribs, little bunk beds, and then mom's bed, where they're being held together. And I know we like to talk about the stories of the real healthy families, but we also need to address head on the issues of where these moms need help right now. And uh, that's, uh, it was very touching. I think particularly too, as a, as a new grandfather, as I was sitting and standing with the, the seven moms in a room as they were going through some of the exercises, it was a group counseling session. There's little Bridget sitting there in the middle of the room. She had little pigtails. She was probably about 13 or 14 months old. Big smile on her face. And I thought how grateful I am that we have professionals, we have systems that are helping that mom for Bridget's future. Um, and that was, it was a very, very touching moment. And how grateful for those of you who grew up in loving homes where you were fed well, you 
moms and dads read to you perhaps, whether it's a single mom or a single dad or whatever your family unit structure was. But as you know, not every family unit, every child is getting that today in this country. And for the work you are doing, I am truly grateful for that. Uh, it's critical that we do have the resources needed uh, to address the, the, that zero to three age group. And lastly, let me say this, we need more babies. <laughs> we have a baby shortage in this country. And you look at the demographics of uh, now of the birth rates that we've, we're now at historic lows in our country of what 1.7 to 1.8 live births per couple and 2.1 is replenishment. We need more babies. Uh, we need more healthy families. And so the work you are doing, it pays long-term return on investment. And I know for those of you, us who have raised children, sometimes you wonder in those zero to three ages uh, in the moment, is this worth it? <laughs> and the answer is a resounding yes. I can't say it loud enough, yes. That famous line from William Wallace, that says, the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the nations, that rules the world. And it's something that we've heard before, but I think the older I get, the more I believe it, uh, to see these important early years, how important they are. There's a reason why the pro football players, when they're taking the shot on the sideline, they don't say, hi, dad, they say, hi, mom. And there's a reason, that important role, uniquely, that mom and that dad play uh, in, their, in those children's lives here to ensure we, we produce healthy, productive citizens here in this country. So thanks for the work you're doing. Uh, you are truly doing work here that, that uh, returns a great investment, and I say that now as a proud, proud grandfather. Thanks much. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Daines. Congratulations on uh, grandfatherhood. Um, and uh, in a second, uh, I have first an announcement. Uh, people should feel free to quietly uh, grab some more food from breakfast if you're getting hungry. Um, uh, there's lots of uh, food there for the taking. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, Myra, who's going to give us the rundown of the state of babies in the United States uh, from this year's yearbook. So, Myra, show's yours. I would also invite people to sit. There's some room up here, so please make yourselves comfortable. Um, I want you to ex you know, be comfortable while I release this. Um, so first, I want to say thank you to Representative DeLauro and Senator Daines for your leadership and for your passion. It is such an honor to be in the same room with you, hearing you talk about the importance of babies and families in this country. And also thanks again to Jonathan and Jamie for joining us this morning. It's great to have you here. The State of Babies Yearbook is an initiative of Think Babies, Zero to Three's campaign to make babies' potential our national priority. Zero to Three is proud to collaborate with our research partner, Child Trends, in the creation of this yearbook. But for those of you who are not familiar with our organizations, let me just say a few words about what we do. Zero to Three is the nation's leading nonprofit organization committed to ensuring infants, toddlers, and their families have what they need for success in life. For more than 40 years, our nonpartisan organization has worked to ensure parents, professionals, and policymakers have the knowledge, will, and know how to make sure all babies have a strong start in life. Child Trends is the nation's leading nonprofit research organization focused exclusively on improving the lives and prospects of children, youth, and their families. For 40 years, decision makers have relied on their rigorous research, unbiased analyses, and clear communications to improve public policies and interventions that serve children and families. We're also grateful, as we mentioned earlier, for the support of our funding partners, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which supports the Think Babies campaign's public education aspects, and the Perigee Fund, which supports the campaign's public education and advocacy. And we encourage you to learn more about the campaign by going to thinkbabies.org. And finally, we are so grateful to the panel of national experts who provided guidance during our indicator selection and state ranking process. Thank you so much. There is no better way to predict the future of our nation than to look at how we are treating our babies today. 
There are 12 million infants and toddlers in the United States. Each of the 4 million babies that will be born in this country this year represent a bundle of unlimited potential. As a nation, we cannot afford to squander the potential of a single child. We know the first three years of a child's life shape every year that follows. A baby's brain develops faster between the ages of zero to three than at any later point in life. And during these first few years of life, more than one million new neural connections are formed every second. Helping them thrive sets a strong foundation for the rest of their lives and for our future as a nation. And doing so requires good nutrition, nurturing relationships with parents and caregivers, access to medical care, and positive early learning experiences. When babies don't get what their growing brains need to thrive, they don't develop as they should, leading to lifelong developmental, academic, social, and health challenges. Every baby should be ensured the opportunity to reach their full potential. Yet far too many babies face persistent hardships, like food insecurity, unstable housing, and exposure to violence. All of these undermine their ability to grow and thrive. And for the first time, zero to three in child trends are telling the state-by-state -state story of how our babies are doing. With today's release of the State of Babies Yearbook 2019, we hope to make clear that when we think babies and invest in infants, toddlers, and their families, we ensure a strong future for us all. So, the State of Babies Yearbook is a first-of-its-kind resource that takes a holistic look at the nation's babies and presents a snapshot, nationwide and state-by-state, state, of how infants, toddlers, and their families are faring based on nearly 60 indicators of well-being in three domains. Our goal in developing the yearbook was to give policymakers and advocates the information and data they need to understand how babies are doing across the country, where they're doing well, and where they face challenges, and also to use the data to shape policies to improve outcomes for young children, which may mean building on the strengths of existing practices or taking innovative new steps. The yearbook is a tool that state policymakers and advocates can use to do a few things. Tell the story of infants and toddlers in, their nation, in, this, in the nation and in their states. Compare their state's progress for infants and toddlers with that of other states using a common set of indicators. Identify indicators on which babies and toddlers are lagging so states can work on responsive policies. And finally, to use annual updates to monitor trends in the experiences of infants, toddlers, and their families and track progress in states' policies. Zero to three work with child trends to select indicators of infants, toddlers, and their families' well-being in the three areas of zero to three's policy framework. The data were obtained from national data sets that provide reliable, they're available annual, annually, and comparable data for all 50 states and the district. You can find more details on our wonderful new website, stateofbabies.org. The three domains of well-being examined in the State of Babies Yearbook are aligned with Zero to Three's policy framework of good health, strong families, and positive early learning experiences. Indicators examined in each framework area were used to assess child and family well-being, accessibility and reach of programs and services, and the presence or absence of key policies that promote healthy development in young children. The profile of America's babies is more diverse than at any point in our history. Today, more than half of the nation's babies are children of color. It is so important that we embrace the changing portrait of our nation's babies and their families and ensure that our policies are responsive to their diverse needs. Families in the U.S. are not all the same, and they reflect our changing society. 21% of babies live with a single parent and a growing number, 9%, live in grandparent-headed households. 61% of babies have mothers in the workforce. There are several areas in which national and state-level findings in the yearbook present early warnings that we are not giving infants and toddlers the, the, everything that they need to thrive. Unfortunately, young children, and particularly babies, are the group most likely to be poor in this country. Think about that. 
It is critical that every baby have the same opportunities to thrive. However, significant disparities exist in opportunities and the related outcomes. Because of historical and structural inequalities, children of color are more likely to be poor, to be born too soon or too early or too small, and to live in environments that challenge their family's security. They and their families also face challenges accessing the supports that could boost them to a level playing field, such as comprehensive prenatal care and quality early learning experiences. Research consistently finds negative effects of poverty and racial discrimination among young children. These effects appear early and are significant in every domain of well-being. For example, despite improvements in babies' health over time in the US, as a group, infants and toddlers of color experience significant disparities in key areas of maternal and infant child and mental health, and mental health in general. Notably, black and American Indian and Alaska Native babies experience disproportionately higher rates of infant mortality and low birth rate than babies of other races. Babies of color, particularly black and Hispanic babies, are also disproportionately represented in the child welfare system, and their permanency rates, or the rates by which they find a permanent home either with their parents, a family member, or through adoption, differ from those of their white peers. We provide an initial look at some of these disparities in the yearbook, and we'll be examining uh, equity more deeply in upcoming briefs. The first of these briefs will address birth outcomes, so stay tuned. The data are clear. The state where a baby is born and spends her three, first three years of life makes a big difference in their chance for a strong start in life. When all state, while all states have room to grow, some are doing better for their babies than others, using effective policy solutions to help infants and toddlers and their families. So to compare states, we use a st transparent ranking process that groups states into one of four tiers that are approximately equal in size. We chose the tier grouping approach to clearly reflect the progress states have made toward ensuring babies have the best opportunity to grow and allow easy comparison of states. We apply a strengths-based approach to the tiers to make sure all states are compelled and empowered to make positive action for babies and families. The symbols for each tier are used throughout the yearbook and on the individual state profiles, and the shades of blue you'll notice become darker the higher the tier. So from the lowest to the highest, the tiers are G for getting started, R for reaching forward, O for improving outcomes, and W working effectively. Each state's ranking was determined by scoring their performance on the indicators within each of the three areas of well-being and overall. While all states have room to grow, their tier, tier rankings reflect differing levels of investment in services and systems for babies and how babies are faring as a result. It's important to bear in mind that states with high or low rankings may do better in some areas than others. So, where do babies in your state stand? Here's how they compared. So we take a look. So I want to pull out some patterns for you. And for those of you who can't see, I promise the reports are out back, but don't go rush over there yet. Uh, but I will explain a few of the patterns. States in the South were more likely to rank in the bottom tier for all three areas, with their best average scores being in the areas of positive early learning experiences and strong families. States in the Northeast and West were more likely to score in the top two tiers of states across all three areas as compared to states in the Midwest and the South. States in the West ranked second highest in good health and ranked similarly to states in the Midwest in the area of strong families. And states in the Northeast ranked highest in all three areas. There are several areas in which infants and toddlers are doing well and several where the national picture is concerning and more work needs to be done. There is good news, for example, in the high number of babies, more than 90%, who have received regularly scheduled medical care in the past 12 months. There are other bright spots where responsive policies are making a difference. We are especially pleased to see how many states are prioritizing the mental health of mothers and babies. 
The Medicaid programs of a majority of states, 36 to be exact, now cover screening for maternal depression, and 41 states offer social-emotional screening for babies, young children. This is great news. But there's still work to be done. Indicators of serious concern include the proportion of infants and toddlers who are not insured, a number that is growing. The incidence of low birth weight, infant mortality, and those uh, outcomes related to maternal and infant and early childhood health are also of concern to us. And how states are doing varies widely on many indicators. For example, despite coverage available through Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program, we all know it as CHIP, almost 6% of low-income infants and toddlers lack health insurance. The number of uninsured babies is a big range, though from less than 1% in Vermont to 15% in North Dakota. So here you have the rankings for good health. And as you can see, in comparing states on good health, in general, states in the Northeast and West were more likely to score in the top two tiers of states for good health as compared to states in the Midwest and the South. And states in the South were more likely to rank in the bottom tier for health with few exceptions, such as higher rankings in Virginia and North Carolina. Most of the indicators in our strong families impact areas address challenges. It's encouraging, then, that four out of five families in this country with infants or toddlers report a favorable level of resilience. Nevertheless, the findings suggest several threats to stability in families with infants and toddlers. Babies are uniquely sensitive to challenges in their environments. The fact that over 16% of babies live in crowded housing should alarm us all. Infants and toddlers also have the highest rates of abuse and neglect of any age group, another terrifying statistic. Fortunately, supportive relationships with close caregivers, especially parents, can buffer, but can buffer the effects of adversity on developing babies. In order for babies to thrive, families need supportive and responsive policies, such as home visits, mental health services, and paid family and medical leave. But we're only reaching a tiny fraction of families with home visiting. And while it's encouraging to see states create their own paid leave programs, we still need a national comprehensive way for all babies to take time to bond with their babies after their birth or adoption, or in times of medical necessity. So there's a noticeable shift here when we look at the rankings for strong families. There are fewer clear differences in regions, although states with the highest rankings in this area are clustered in the Northwest and West, Midwest, and Northeastern states. Here are some notable exceptions uh, in the Northeast and Midwest, such as Michigan, Indiana, New York, and Rhode Island, ranking in the lowest tier. So again, just because you're doing well in some areas doesn't mean you don't have room to grow in others. And despite the importance of early learning that takes place at home, surprisingly few, few parents report engaging in daily reading or singing with their babies. This is really a surprising one. Senator Daines spoke about this a little bit. These are interactions that we know are closely related with strong early literacy and academic performance later. Childcare costs can take more than one third of the paycheck of a single parent in some states, even higher. Despite the high cost of infant care, few families receive assistance for it. Only 12 states allow childcare subsidies for families with incomes above 200% of the federal poverty level. And this amounts to just about 4% of infants and toddlers in low or moderate income families accessing this critical support. And we know that infant toddler care costs more than college tuition in 28 states and the District of Columbia. So these families feel the pinch like none other. So here is what we have for positive early learning experiences. As you can see, states in the West that had higher rankings in the earlier domains now are in the lowest tier, and some of the Central Plain states are doing better. So again, there is variability depending on the domain that we're looking at. If you go to the website, stateofbabies.org, you'll find individual state profiles that provide information on the state's overall ranking and ranking by domain when compared to all other states, key demographics of the state's infants, toddlers, and families, the state's data on key indicators and policies in the three domains of good health, strong families, and positive early learning experiences, and a final summary of all indicators. So 
given all of this information, where do we go from here? These indicators tell us we're not giving babies the best chance to succeed. Dive into them. Go back to your states. Take them back to your offices and talk about them. Figure out a course of action and make something happen for babies. Even improving on what data are collected is an important course of action to take. And we know there is a lot going on in states, and we'll shortly hear from a panel of state folks who are doing great things across the country. But we also have examples for you in the report and an accompanying um, report that you'll get out here later called Promising Approaches in States to even dive a little bit deeper to see those states that are doing well in some areas and not so well in others, but are still doing innovative things for babies in their states. Regardless of the state's ranking, we hope the data provided in the yearbook will be used to foster sharing of information within and among states, create opportunities to learn from one another's experiences, the challenges, and the successes, and most important, we hope it will be used to make significant change for infants and toddlers. We want you to improve these numbers year over year. This is not an exercise in sharing. This is an exercise in getting things done, and we're counting on you. States are often the incubators for innovative ideas, but federal policies and programs are critical to jumpstart innovation and help bring programs to scale, as well as to promote critical priorities and facilitate equitable access and coverage. Addressing important needs like childcare, paid family leave, and access to health care all require strong partnerships and relationships between the federal government and states. That's why we're here in the Senate and the halls of Congress talking about babies and families in states. They don't happen independent of each other. The time to make every baby our national priority is now. To do better for our babies and our nation's future, we all need to make babies a priority through policies built on the science of brain development and budgets that put babies and families first. Babies, families, and the nation as a whole are counting on us to get this done and do it right. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for everything you do for babies and families across the country. Thank you, uh, Myra. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a question and answers, and that includes uh, questions from the audience. Uh, if you, uh, you should have index cards, either they are on your table or given out to you. If you have a question, go ahead and write it down. Staff from zero to three will pick it up, and we'll try to get one or two of those in before we move on to the next, uh, next uh, part of the presentation. But first, I have a few questions. Okay. Um, you spoke uh, at the beginning of your presentation about the demographic shift and uh, um, uh, racial disparities in child well-being. Why does that matter? Why is this not just a question of income? Thank you. So we know that 51% of babies in this country are children of color. The demographics are changing. We also know that structural inequality, um, historical inequality, have made it so that children of color are more likely to be poor, are more likely to live in unsafe environments. This is 51% of our nation, guys. We can't assume that we are going to have a strong country a decade from now, 30 years from now, when these kids grow up, if 51% of them are being shut out of opportunity. This is no longer about those kids and our kids. This is about the entire nation's future. And so we can't um, assume that it's OK to limit opportunity for some children and continue with some of the practices and policies that shut people out of opportunity. For example, in a, not having access to fair lending that shuts families out of living in stronger communities. Or poor education that limits parents' abilities and preparedness for going on to college and providing for better education for themselves and their children. This all spirals down to children. What I hope the report shows you is that these demographics are important for our future, and children bear the brunt of these disparities. This is not something that only happens to adults. It starts at birth. And so we have to be thinking about what we can do to disrupt any inequalities or disparities, because this is our future. We cannot afford to squander their opportunity. Sorry. 
Uh, good segue, because my next question was going to be about national priorities for, I mean, what, did, what does this tell you about in general directions for national policy? Where, where should we be going? I think there's really exciting uh, to think about where we are with paid family and medical leave and that we see this happening in states across the country and we also see it happening at the national level. This is bipartisan, it is bicameral, we're having it, we see it in the White House, that people are talking about this. We recognize that the critical thing about secure attachment, the critical piece of, of that time in a child's life when all of those brain synapses are firing, they need to have that critical attachment with their parents. And it is really hard to do that if you are working two or three jobs or even one job and you're frazzled and you, you're taking time off, uh, or you can't take time off to work. Or, I'm sorry, you can't take time off to be with your, with your child. We know that a um, one in four mothers is back to work within 10 days of having her child. So I think paid family leave is a really great opportunity we should be focusing on. Child care, as something you know, um, you write about quite a bit, is um, out of reach for so many families. And so we want families working. We want them to be able to go to work, but we don't want them to put their children in challenging places that are threatening their, their development. We know a poor setting is actually detrimental to the strong development of a young child. And we cannot afford to have a parent who can't focus at work because they're worried about the safety of their child. And we can't afford to have a child in a place that is not um, stimulating all of those synapses and all that great potential that's happening in the brain at that early, those early years. So those are two big ones I would focus on. Let's, uh, let's uh, stay on child care for a second and uh, maybe I can get you to talk a little bit more about the challenge of the child care. Um, sometimes you hear it presented as a cost problem that's too expensive for people. Sometimes you hear it presented as a quality problem. Child care quality is not very good. Um, at some point, those two can seem in tension because uh, improving the quality can make child care more expensive. How do you sort of see it in terms of is it cost, is it quality, is it both? I mean, how do you approach that? So. I think we need to flip the question, and the question is really not the cost and, and how expensive this is if we pay for it. The cost that we really should be thinking of is the cost to society if we don't invest in high quality early learning for young children. We know the rate of return on high quality early care and education is a better bet than just about any other social policy you can think of. So when we can't, we have to stop thinking about putting quality and access against each other because babies' brains don't think in that way. Babies' brains think about nurturing relationships, stimulating experiences, and we know that as a social policy issue, this is the smartest thing we could possibly be doing. And so we need to make sure that our policies are not burdening the families who require this. And they're not putting children in places that are threatening um, their, their healthy development. So I want to talk about these ratings. Um, I'm tempted to ask how long you guys had to figure out how to come up with the acronym GROW. That was really <laughs> many clever. Emails, many emails. Um, uh, but uh, you know, as a, as a resident of Michigan, I was very disappointed to see my state not higher up. And I'm wondering, I'm sure a lot of states will look at this and hang their heads in shame or, or, or what. Now, what, what do you want states to, state lawmakers, states to do when they see this data? What, what's, the, what's the goal? So first of all, we don't want anybody to be ashamed. We want states to be compelled to act. You're not doing us any good if you're hanging your head in shame, and that's not our intention. We want you to look at these numbers and see them as a roadmap. And really, just to start picking off, we have 60 indicators that you can start addressing today. And so what this is, what we want states to do is partner with other states, look across their neighboring states and see how they're doing, and see if they have a higher indicator and figure out how the heck they got that. We want advocates to use this tool to say, hey guys, this isn't too great. This is, we are not, we want you to, you know, we want people who read your articles, we want advocates to be able to use this tool and walk in, into their offices of their members of Congress or the legislators back home and have a conversation about what needs to happen and actually look at our policy indicators that help you think about which levers you could be pulling to make a change. So this is not a shaming document. It's a document that we want people to use to feel compelled and empowered to do something about babies. I'll stop there. I could keep on going. Um, I actually have a related question from the audience, which is, um, can you talk about uh, what kind of plan you have to share these results in a meaningful way 
uh, with state representatives and policymakers who will be working on this directly. Yes. So one, we have 20, 20 advocates or advocates from 20 states in the room. So we are hoping that you all are going to come back and use this. We're counting on you. Um, we have a webinar that we have next, next week. I think it's March 6th. Folks can stay tuned to that, where we give details on how to use this. If you go to our website, there's an amazing, you go to the Take Action section. There's a whole toolkit that you can use, beautiful graphics that are individualized for all 50 states and the district that you can use to send to your members of Congress, to have conversations with folks. Um, we also have a huge media, social media blitz that we want people to be you know, sharing this. Um, but really, another thing is I would love to come talk to you um, about this in states and have members of the team come in and go and speak. I've been invited already to talk in a few states so that your legislators can hear firsthand that they're doing a great job and they need to continue doing a great job. Or, hey, guys, we're not doing so great, but here's some help. This, this is a roadmap. Um, so a few ways you guys can get involved. And please contact our office. We would love to help you out. Um, another uh, audience question. Can you speak on the disproportionately high prevalence of infant mortality in the black community? What factors does your research suggest uh, contribute to this? So, and this is something I'm really excited about uh, in our upcoming report where we will dig deep into these numbers. Um, we know that black mothers um, are more likely to die in childbirth or have high rates of morbidity regardless of income. Right? So I have a PhD, I have a very comfortable income, and if I were to have a children, I'm not going to have another child, I'm done. Uh, but if it were, I would have a, a high, there's a more likely, it's more likely that I would die in childbirth than my white neighbor down the street. The same is true for babies of color, uh, infants and toddlers, black infants and toddlers. And I think we really have to take a dark, a deep, deep look at structural and I'm gonna say racial inequality in this country where black women's voices are not respected, they're not trusted, they're not heard. We have inequal, inequal access to health insurance and prenatal care. You'll see in the report there are huge disparities there. And again, we can't afford to squander the potential of 16% of our babies and assume that it's okay that nine in 1,000 babies in Alabama, and there's a disproportionate rate of black babies in Alabama who are dying. It's not okay. If you, take, if you think about what Senator Daines said about our birth rate, we are at historic lows in this country with our birth rate. So we can't assume that some of the kids are disposable, and it's okay that they're dying at higher rates because those children we need to become leaders, to become workers, and to become um, the new innovators. And we, we, it, it's, just, it's, it's such a deeply personal um, question for me, so I'm not gonna go there, but I, we, we just cannot afford to, to squander that potential. So I think this is a bigger conversation we need to be having. The last thing I'll say, as I'm so happy that these conversations are happening between the maternal and infant communities right now, for a long time it was just an issue of women or it was just an issue of babies, but this is something that we have to tackle together. Uh, one last question before we go to our state panel. What's next in terms of research that you guys are going to be doing for the yearbook? And what's the next stage? Yeah, so we have very big plans um, for the yearbook. So we plan on digging deep, as we said, on um, equity and disparities there. Um, and we're also working on refining our indicators. We want to figure out if there's a way to represent some of our indicators in a way that's more compelling, and also to really get at some of the questions that we just couldn't get at because the data weren't there. Uh, in particular, rates of child obesity for young children. That's a hard number to get at for infants and toddlers. Again, using reliable data, di data that's available annually and comparable across states. And the other is the issue of infant toddler quality. We do not have a standard way of looking at how, looking at the quality of infant toddler care in this country. And so that's another one that we're very excited about. And one last question. Um, since each state differs uh, so much in their scores, 
Um, are, the proposed, are proposed policies meant to be something that's done at the state level? Is this a federal action? Is it both? I mean. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. Whoever asked that question, thank you. That's a great question. Um, this has to be done in tandem. They, you can't have um, just the federal government going out there and creating bills that then don't make sense at the state level and vice versa. And so what we really need to make sure is, so the federal government is sending out a lot of money, right, for CCDBG, for example, um, that was a historic increase. Not enough, we still need more. Um, but we need to make sure that there is synergy there between states when that money comes down. So there's great potential um, in the infant toddler quality set aside that states are using. How can they use that to make sure that we're really advancing the cause around quality? We know so many states use that money to increase access for infants and for families with infants and toddlers. So we, those conversations don't happen in a bubble or independent of each other. Um, and I would also say, you know, with paid family leave, again, we need to have a national um, dialogue around that. It's, and, but the national dialogue can be in conversation with what states are already doing. So, ooh, I'm cheating. I'm standing on a, on a pillar because I'm 5'1". Um, so, sorry, I'm safe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I should mention there will be copies of the yearbook available on your way out, and staff are here uh, to answer if you have any detailed methodological questions. Um, uh, in the meantime, I'm going to invite the state panel up to the table here. And uh, I'll go ahead and start with the introduction. I'm going to introduce all three of them, and then I'll let each of them uh, uh, give uh, some introductory remarks, and then I'll ask them some questions. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, immediately to my right is uh, Josh Baker. Uh, Josh is director of the South Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. It was appointed by uh, General Henry McMaster in 2017. Uh, Prior to that, served as Deputy Chief of Staff for Budget and uh, Policy to Governor Nikki Haley, crafting the executive budgets for 2015 through 2017. Director Baker will, is here to talk about several initiatives to uh, improve birth outcomes as well as uh, ongoing health of young children in the state of South Carolina. Uh, next to Josh is Diane uh, Delano. Did I get that right? Delano. Delano. Damn. Delano. Uh, uh, who is a policy analyst and member of the Early Childhood Team at Advocates for Children of New Jersey. Uh, she brings more than 30 years of experience in early childhood and family issues in advocating for investments. Uh, after researching studies on quality child care, she developed a campaign to improve early learning policies uh, and programs for infants and toddlers in New Jersey. She will talk to us about that campaign and what it's accomplished. Last. Uh, over on the right, who was sitting next to me earlier, uh, Roderick Bremby is, uh, and you've heard about him from Congresswoman DeLauro, is the commissioner uh, of the Connecticut Department of Social Services. Uh, there he has overseen initiatives to transform Medicaid, uh, use technology and better business practices to improve client service delivery and service integration across multiple programs. Today, he will talk to us about a new initiative for the babies in the city of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, to help them meet their developable milestones uh, right from the start. Like I said, I've asked each of the, we've asked each of the panelists to give a couple introductory remarks. So, uh, Josh, let's go ahead and start with you. Thank you. Is that working? Is that working? Oh, there we go. All right. Um, well, good morning. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you to Zero to Three and, and uh, the Robert Johnson Foundation Child Trends for having us here today. I, I do appreciate it. As with many of my colleagues in Medicaid agencies across the nation, uh, I got an advanced copy, but, but we're going to take a look at this and realize that, that there's still challenges in our community. South Carolina is a state that has long struggled with um, early childhood screening, um, poor fetal and maternal outcomes. And really, that's what I'm here to talk about today. But before we get into the initiatives, I, I sort of wanted to take the big systemic view that, that I often have to take when I walk into work every day and, and sort of drill it down to the small in the community. 
South Carolina uh, has about 1.4% of everybody who's in the Medicaid or CHIP program. So we're a small state, um, but, but that small state and my small program relatively um, is still a $7.7 .7 billion enterprise that covers one of every five people in South Carolina, 60% of births, and with the other predominant, one other predominant commercial insurer in the state, six out of every seven births um, are covered by one of two payers, often by a person who's covered by both of them. So you would think um, that we could just get together, jam the wonder twin you know, rings together and say, bam, we've got this problem fixed. Um, but we still have some, some sort of persistent problems. And, and you see it here in the report. I'm, I'm glad we got the advanced copy because we see um, deficiencies in access to and utilization of um, prenatal care. It's either late or doesn't exist at all. And we see that in the Medicaid eligibility too, where sometimes we're, we're learning about the mom um, at the birth event um, because that's when we receive the application for medical assistance. Um, we see about 5% of infant and toddlers without any insurance at all. Again, for context, that's about 8,800 children in South Carolina. So what a lot of these initiatives are, um, are focused not at broad systemic changes to the Medicaid program generally, but activation at the local community level. So um, a, a few things I'm going to rattle off for and then we'll pass it along. One is what we call the Birth Outcomes Initiative that was really focused on um, bringing births to full term, seeing if we could do something about low birth weight babies, um, focusing on maternal substance use and, and really trying to stabilize that pregnancy right up to the birth event. And then um, birth spacing, which is something that I don't think we talk about quite enough, but, but is a significant contributor to birth outcomes. At the time of its inception later, uh, as a second initiative, South Carolina had the nation's largest uh, pay for success home visiting program partnering with the nurse family partnership i don't know that it's the largest anymore but it was at the time uh, we also have a pediatric care collaborative that started off with the q-tip grant that was part of chipro when um, the funding ran out the pediatric community loved it so much that they wanted to continue that's where we're focusing on those um, parental depression and substance use screening really taking that two generation approach to evaluation when we're in that trusted pediatrician's office. And then thanks to an executive order signed by my former boss right after I came over to the agency, um, we took over the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act Part C program, integrating the fund sources and management of that program with Medicaid. Um, one of the things Myra talked about was access of people who are eligible but currently not participating. Uh, I had my folks pull some information. Fiscal year 15-16, 8,325 kids had individual plans under the, IFA, under the IDA Part C program. Year to date, with four months left, we're at 8,800. So in just a couple years, active management and aggressive marketing can make a huge difference in penetration into communities that are underserved. So um, all four of those programs, really the theme is, let's just get out there and make contact and use the levers we have and extend them to the community. So um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over. Good morning. Um, as John said, I'm Diane Delano, and I'm with the Advocates for Children of New Jersey. And it's my pleasure to be here today representing New Jersey as one of zero to three's Think Babies states. Yay, Think Babies. Um, <laughs> It's been a wonderful opportunity uh, to be a part of this initiative. And um, so my job at ACNJ, Advocates for Children of New Jersey, is uh, to think babies all day and all night, just like uh, new moms often do, um, to figure out ways and what babies need and what we could do better. Um, so it's a fabulous job, and I'm so excited to, to be a part of this. Um, for over 40 years, Advocates for Children of New Jersey has been known as the most trusted and respected state advocacy organization in New Jersey. And we earn that reputation because the policy recommendations that we make, the funding recommendations that we make, are based on solid research and data, much like what you're going to find in the state yearbook. Um, it's critical to have that kind of information to make change happen. So um, we're so excited to have this new resource and to be able to bring it back to New Jersey to um, utilize it that way. 
Um, as a Kids Count state, we have been collecting and analyzing data on child well-being and family well-being for over 25 years. And we know firsthand the power that kind of data can have and having that to be able to use it to help drive change is, is critically important. This past year we focused a whole edition of our babies count, I mean of our kids count on babies called Babies Count. And that information to be able to present it to people, to give them data specific to infants and toddlers to tell them that babies have unique needs. They're not like everybody else. They need a wide variety of services and attention like none other. And, you know, we as parents and grandparents, et cetera, know that, right? So um, we're able to take that information, use that information to drive our strategy and, and to drive the campaign. Um, and the way that we're going to be doing things can be focused on what the needs, the actual needs of infants and toddlers are. So having that level of data has been critical for us um, in helping us move forward our agenda. In particular, our childcare agenda for infants and toddlers. It was very valuable for us to look at it as what is different about infants and toddlers in the childcare system and what are their needs and what can we do to make a difference in, the, in, in childcare, but looking at infants and toddlers in particular. And when you break it down to that level, you see some enormous differences and, and challenges that you have to overcome um, just with that population. So getting started, we know we needed new data. I mean, we knew how many babies we have in our state. We knew how many of them are, are living in poverty, um, under 200% of the poverty level, um, where we knew that those babies could be eligible for a child care subsidy in our state, yet only 5% were accessing um, a child care subsidy. And in our state, we have no waiting list. So it's not that, you know, oh, well, they're on a waiting list. No. That's a data point where you have to look at it and say, what is going on? Why aren't parents with babies able to access that? We have 69% of our mothers in the workforce that have babies under the age of three. Another data point is sit there saying, what's going on? Why aren't these moms, and it's not early head start, we don't have enough of those slots either. So looking at these data points and try asking that question why, I mean, Myra was saying, you, you gotta take this data back and you gotta look at it. like." Why is our number like that? And what can we do about it? So we knew we needed more data. We needed richer data, deeper data, as Myra was saying. You need to dive deep. You need to look at this and really try to figure out what it is that's going on. So we did two very critical studies um, that helped us move forward our agenda very rapidly. Uh, one was our quality of, um, you know, our cost of quality study where we analyzed what it costs to provide childcare based on the quality standards set up by our state. It wasn't like a made up thing, it was, okay, this is what the state says your quality is on our quality rating and improvement system. This is what they're expecting our childcare programs to get to. How can we get to it if our subsidy rate is so low? So what are the costs involved? And we use real data. It wasn't uh, you know, just pulled out of a hat. We went and collected data from child care centers, asked them, what does it cost? What is your mortgage or your rent cost? What are your you know, costs for your personnel? What are the costs for your equipment, supplies, et cetera? And plug them into the cost of quality calculator and we're able to figure out what was going on. It gave us answers. It told us you know, exactly what happens in a center that has too many babies on child care subsidy, that has too many infants and toddlers in, the, in their program. You can't operate a child care center with just infants and toddlers. You know, so centers were figuring this out, and you couldn't operate a child care center, you couldn't operate a quality child care center with the given subsidy. Um, and if you had more babies on subsidy, forget it. Um, you couldn't do it. So we had that data. The, that data gave us one other critical piece of information. In our state, our infant-toddler child care subsidy reimbursement rate was the same. Yet, when we looked at it, it costs more to provide care for infants than it does toddlers. So we knew there was a huge problem there. Um, so that was one study. The next study, which was a little difficult to do, but I did it, we had to try to figure out how many childcare centers in New Jersey were actually providing care for infants and toddlers. Now, 
you'd think you could go to licensing and ask licensing, oh, well, how many are licensed? But no, it doesn't work that way. They, have, they know who's licensed, but they don't know who is providing care. And even if you knew who's providing care, they're licensed to serve an extraordinary amount of children, which no child care center that I talked to would ever fill it up with that many kids. Um, so we called them, we, inter we, we interviewed them over the phone, you know, we uh, did some surveys and we found out, you know, they aren't serving babies. And if they are serving babies, they limit the number of babies, you know, because babies are where the most costs are. They take up the most room, they take up the most staff, you know, so child care centers have figured it out. And the subsidy rate, certainly, why would I take the same amount of money to care for four babies when I could get six babies and make more money. You know, so those that were business savvy were like, I'm not gonna take an infant because it's, it's going to damage you know, my, my program in terms of, of our fiscal net, uh, soundness. Um, so we figured it out that, okay. So it's not that these moms um, weren't accessing, I mean, they, they, they wanted to access the subsidy program, but they couldn't because childcare programs were not taking babies. You know, so they would go to a center and say, oh, I have a childcare subsidy, and they'll say, okay, well, we only have a few slots, so there were enormous waiting lists in those centers that did actually serve babies. You know, we had, we, they also may have decided not to serve babies at all. So we knew that parents were not able to use the subsidy um, and we're just saying, well, I have a subsidy, but it doesn't do me any good. And the ones that were saying, well, we'll take your subsidy, but we're gonna charge you the gap between what it costs to provide quality infant care and what the subsidy is gonna provide, and no low-income family can pay for that. Um, so we had a problem. Um, and we also found that there were deserts throughout our state, areas where there was absolutely no infant toddler child care. Um, and parents couldn't access. So we were like, where are the babies? Who's taking care of them? There was only space for 27% of the parent, of, of children like, likely to need care because all families, all parents in their household worked. 27%. So where are the rest of these babies being cared for in unregulated care somewhere? We needed to figure this out. We needed to let people know that this was a real problem. You know, so, um, so we got all of this data, and I'm gonna quickly tell you what happened with the data. Um, what happened is we shared it, um, we shared our stories with everybody, um, we brought parents and providers in to also share their stories, and what happened this past year, after 10 years of being starved, and no, having no childcare subsidy rate, we got two subsidy rate increases, and the most amount of the increases came to babies. You know, they heard our message, you know, and we were like, Thrilled. Same thing happened with tiered reimbursement. We never had tiered reimbursement before. They did tiered reimbursement, and again, babies got more. And that was the kind of message that we wanted, you know, to have, that babies needed more, they deserved more. And when we did get our additional amount of money through uh, the CCDF, it went to babies. 25% increase to the infant toddler rate, I mean, to the infant rate went to babies. They did separate the rate out for us this year. First time ever. They didn't know why they had it that way. You know, so when we said that, they were like, we don't know. And they separated it. So, I mean, we're thrilled. Um, they also put in monies for an initiative to uh, look at how we can incentivize childcare so that um, we'll have additional slots for babies. And um, so it's, it's we're, we're still in O, G-R-O. We want our W, um, so we still have more to do. So good morning, everyone. I'm gonna race through some comments. Uh, there's a slide on the back table. If you didn't get it coming in, there's one available. This is really the Bridgeport Baby Bundle graphic form, but I'm just gonna give you a 30,000 foot view of it this morning. Uh, this is not a program, but it's an emerging framework for child family well-being. It's a two or more generational approach. This was really driven by data from Bridgeport Prospers. It's a collective impact effort that's housed in Fairfield County United Way. And they used the data to come up with an audacious goal for its future. They had a glimpse at their future looking at the data, and I'll share some of the data with you in just a few minutes. 
But they decided that they needed to establish a goal, and that goal is by beginning in the year 2018, all Bridgeport-born babies will reach their expected health and developmental benchmarks by the age of three. Audacious. Let me tell you why it's audacious. Bridgeport is the largest city in the state of Connecticut, 146,000 people. But it's surrounded by wealthiest towns and cities in the state and in the nation. It's also a place where 99.9% .9 of public school children are eligible for free and reduced meals. Largest student achievement gap in the state. Nine, nine percent of fifth graders are proficient in math. 24% of third graders read at grade level. Three of 10 children enter kindergarten ready. And the shocker for us as we were processing the data is that 75% of three-year-olds entering Head Start were behind. 21% of moms received no or inadequate prenatal care. And lastly, 63%, much like Joshua's numbers, of those 3,000 annual births are Medicaid funded. This is not about programs. It's really not about funding. It's about systems, systems development and systems alignment. We have to optimize the systems that we have, and yet Bridgeport decided that beginning in 2018, all of its babies would reach their health and developmental milestones by age three. Now, how is that possible? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so it's the baby bundle. It's a collective impact process that has three key premises. It's neuroscience-based. We member of, mem <laughs> a number of us are members of an organization called, um, uh, uh, well, Jack Shankoff launched a group, Frontiers of Innovation, some years ago. We've been sitting around the table talking about how brain science impacts development. The bundle of strategies is also a core premise, meaning that there's no silver bullet. The programs that we align within the system are even either evidence-based or evidence-suggested. But we need rapid cycle innovation. We need to try stuff and a lot of stuff. And then lastly, in terms of the premise, we need to build out a 21st century ecosystem. This is not about Bridgeport. It's not about Fairfield County. It's not about the state of Connecticut, but it's vertical and horizontal. In the remaining time, let me talk about the five core strategies. You can find them in the very center of this chart, right under the red uh, pointer. And then I'm going to walk through a practical example of how the baby bundle will work. So the first core strategy is supported care and parenting. We all know about, you know, home visiting but we thought that we might want to look at a light touch and a heavy touch. Joshua talked about nurse family partnership. That is a heavy touch for us. Mm -hmm. We know that there are lighter touches for families who need just a little gentle reminder, support as they move forward. But we're, our goal is to make sure that every child leaving the hospital has the opportunity based upon an assessment to get a light touch or a heavy touch. Deep and in innovative neighborhood engagement. We know it's gonna take an army it's gonna take a lot of people to kind of focus together. Army of Helpers and Advocates, we have uh, launched a statewide uh, effort of uh, screening resilience. It's, it's to increase our literacy about what trauma does. It's the tax that people pay emotionally, physically, and psychologically. It's that hidden tax that requires more effort and more difficulty, and so, if families will begin to understand that where they live, they can better understand how other families are uh, being affected by that as well. The baby bundle investment opportunity. Now, this is one that we thought was unique and we didn't realize how unique it was until the dividends started coming in. We hired a development expert to go out into the county and begin to talk with high wealth individuals to see if they would be interested in scholarshiping babies. Guess what? They were. Not only were they interested, 
they wanted to race each other to see who could scholarship a baby first. So we just tagged $3,000 for a scholarship. We believe that was above and beyond all the government resources and all the uh, foundation resources that are put into play. But a $3,000 effort to fund those services that could be funded any other way. We have pledges, commitments for over $64 million. Now, what we're doing now is we're trying to scale this statewide. We're looking at the public-private partnership, the mix. We want to help people understand why this matters. And once they understand why it matters, they're willing to come out of their pockets. They're wanting to scholarship babies. And then the last strategy is track, change, and measure impact. This is why this meeting today is so critically important. If we don't measure the outcomes, we'll never get to where we want to be. I believe that we'll look back on today, this meeting, as sea change in the way that we invest in the babies of our nation. I mean, this is a fundamental meeting, and I'm glad that you're all here. But we have researchers at Yale Child Study Center. Um, Dr. Ziegler and I uh, and Myra uh, talked about three years ago. We had the opportunity to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Head Start. I happen to be a Head Start baby. And uh, actually, it was one of the reasons why I went back to Connecticut to work, was to try to give back. But we've got to me measure and track change. Otherwise, we're not going to move the needle. So lastly, or closing out, what I want to say is, one of my favorite writers is Terry Tempest Williams. And she writes about the environment. Um, part of my background, my professional background is environmental. But in one of her books, she writes, the eyes of the future are looking back at us and they are praying for us that we will see beyond our own time. We will see beyond our own time. That's what this opportunity does today. And I want to thank the sponsors for allowing us to look past today, look into the future of enhanced well-being for our babies, our families, our communities, and our nation. This is really about aligning systems, optimizing systems, and doing what's best for babies and their families. So I'm looking forward to partnering with all of you as we move this forward together. Thank you. Um, those were great. Uh, we're going to do some question and answer right now. I'm going to ask you guys a few questions. I'll direct each one to one of you, but feel free to jump in afterwards if you have related thoughts. And then at some point we'll break and we'll do a few more audience questions. I think this time we'll just do hands uh, instead of cards uh, for the remainder. But first, uh, I want to ask uh, Josh a question. Um, first, something you said caught my attention. You talked about active promotion and getting the word out. Can you Describe what does that mean in practice I and mean, what does that look like you getting the word out about these programs and 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 you know What how important has that been? Uh, sure, so it's uh, really you have to take advantage of every channel that you have available to you. So um, one of the most trusted uh, Homes in in healthcare is the pediatrician's office. So there's there's a lot of winning hearts and minds, right? It's going to their conference. It's talking to them. It's sending your technical assistance out into the field to help them Two, it's really this um, sort of uh, not me approach to programs and services has to get conquered. So we refer Medicaid families um, to our uh, relatively young 4K system by reaching out directly. We, we send postcards, we provide information on application, and then um, through just basic advertising will will make people aware of the programs and services that are available. It's it's no different than any other product you're trying to sell. You're trying to sell um, a family's opportunity to take control of their environment and their life, and, and that's hopefully what we can finance. Um, because I remind people constantly, I, I don't do anything and I don't regulate anything. All we do is purchase. So what we want to do is pair you with the thing that you need and provide the financial um, power to help you attain and receive that service and capitalize on it. Yeah, I just want to talk a little bit more about um, how this works in terms of outreach as well. So with us, it starts with prenatal moms. As Joshua said, um, pediatricians are the place where it all comes together. 
we established a pay for success arrangement with our OBGYNs so that as a mom comes in for care, if she comes in for adequate prenatal, then the pediat or the OBGYN gets a bonus, a bonus payment. If it's a scheduled vaginal delivery, another bonus, not a scheduled C-section, okay? Um, as the mom comes in for pre and post delivery depression screening, that's more resources that the office can earn. So when doctors learn that this is available, that's outreach. That's outreach, no flyers. So they actually get bonuses. I mean, there's an actual monetary exactly. something attached to it. Okay. So we also have a pay for success arrangement with our primary care docs, our PCMH, or our primary care medical homes. We've established an upside risk only pool so that if quality measures are met, children are getting their well child visits, they can earn more money. They can earn more resources. These are investments that we make in health early and often so that we don't have to pay downstream higher more chronically. So that's another way to do outreach. Diane, uh, you were talking about the data and how the data enabled you to get these changes. And this may be because I'm a cynical journalist, but I mean, uh, I, it's always sort of, there's something a little shocking about it. You mean you actually just provided information and that, you know, made a change. Does data really per persuade people? I mean, you're, at the end of the day, no matter how compelling your case, you're asking, you're talking about moving money around or getting more money or something, and there's always some resistance. Does data really make a difference? It's how you present the data that can make the difference. Um, what we did with the data is we broke it down by legislative district. And okay. It's how we presented it by bringing parents with us and providers with us to tell the story, giving the face to the data so that people can really understand, you know, what is happening. I mean, we had this one mom who, you know, said, described for us pulling up to a child care center that accepted a subsidy, seeing garbage all over, seeing the crime on the streets, seeing an unsupervised child in front of the center wandering around and saying to herself, this is what my subsidy will pay for. This is what I need to do. I have to put food on my table. You know, and so making that data mean something, you know, that's, the, it, and I'm telling you, we, for 10 years, we did not get a subsidy increase. As soon as we started saying, look, we're gonna start with babies, because maybe it was too big to say, okay, we want, cross the board, everybody have the same kind of increase. We just made the data say, you know, infants, we can't do this. We cannot do this. And why you cannot do this? And what is happening in our state? And making it local. Taking it and putting it in, in a way that they could understand um, in showing them. We had desert data to hand to every single legislator that said, these are the deserts in your community. These are the low-income families in your community that don't have access to high-quality licensed child care. I wonder, Josh, what you, you can speak to this. Um, you're in a state that has a reputation for doing a lot of these uh, aggressive, innovative programs. Uh, what's, and you've gotten buy-in from, mm -hmm. it seems like, both parties. I mean, what, is there a secret sauce to, to, to getting this past the usual political fights or, or, I mean, getting everybody to buy into it? Yeah, so, so babies have a surprisingly broad constituency in most yeah. legislatures. Babies are popular, it turns out. Um, so it is... It's a product that in many ways sells itself. Yeah, um, right. but it, it, no, I mean, I, I think that back to the data issue, uh, you know, I wrote budgets for a long time um, from a central government perspective. And um, most of, I got a lot of, here's a problem, money will fix it, or pay and trust pitches over um, a period of time. And I think that there's been a shift um, in, in my predecessor in this position and, and something that, that I hold dear here too is that um, there's just so many resources tied up in these programs that, that a story has to be told about pay and impact, what happens when we make these investments. And I think that that's something that, that legislators and appropriators in particular are um, really yearning for, which is they, they, they like the emotional feel and the anecdote because it helps them sell it to their colleagues, but really being able to wrap something is something tangible around the fact that, you know, if we do a better, if, if we hold obstetricians and hospitals to account for elective preterm births 
and we elect not to pay them and we force them, it is going to be hard. They're going to be mad. They will call you, but then more babies will be born at term and that will be better for all of us. Um, that, that's a thing people can get behind because it's specific and it's tangible. Um, and then when it works, you build enough credibility to where they'll, they'll trust you to continue to go through that churn. The challenge to the agency and, and to the, the programmatic folks is continuing to find those opportunities for improvement. And that's why every once in a while having something that says, hey, thanks for what you're doing. Here's the next four or five things you need to do anyway. Um, success should be rewarded by new challenges. Um, so, so we shouldn't sort of rest and say we did this thing. We have to constantly be looking for that marginal gain. For you, uh, 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 Commissioner, what it seems like for a long time, uh, the discussion about uh, young children, th there was a lot of focus on pre-K, four-year-olds, you know, that. And it feels like there's more of a shift now. There's more of an awareness. We've been talking about this of younger children, babies, and, and, and I'm wondering, first of all, and, and you guys can all weigh in on this, actually. I mean, do you feel like there's been a shift, and why? I mean, what, 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 what explains it? How, why has that discussion moved and recognized there's something different going on? Yeah, I think that um, largely it's because of uh, Heckman's work, you know, Nobel laureate. He's been able to show economically that it's the best place for investment. Go upstream. Why pay downstream costs that are exorbitant when you can invest early and prevent them? So I think people are getting the message. And hopefully we'll see more opportunities to uh, invest in the systems that care for children and their babies uh, and their families earlier. Um, we, were, uh, we were talking earlier, right? We had a, a discussion earlier about, okay, what do you hope state officials will do with this data? All right, you guys are state local officials. What are you going to do with this data? What's it, you know, what's, is, is it helpful? Anybody feeling ashamed about how your state is doing or really excited? Or? No, we're really excited. But as yes. uh, Joshua says, you know, success is rewarded by more challenges. So we're going to look for more challenges. One of the data points that I wanted to spike out was the, uh, the lack of preventative dental care within our state. We have a, a Medicaid program that's one of the best in terms of dental care, and I want to see if we're actually there in preventative services. But also, right now, at the State House, there is this ongoing conversation about paid medical leave. And so this is an opportunity to bring some data back to the group and say, look, let's look at this policy opportunity in line with other states, and how can we improve the well-being of babies. It's not you know, about uh, making sure that workers are able to come back to the workplace and are available. It's also looking at the babies. What's the impact on the babies? So it's another angle of attack, policy-wise. Um, not going to lie, we want the W. Um, you know, New Jersey is not going to rest until you know, we are a gross state. You know? So um, I think it's, it, that, that kind of information is going to tell us, like, look, we, we still have a lot more to do, and we're going to use it that way to say, you know, yes, we've had some successes, but it's not enough, and there's a lot of areas that have room for improvement, and these are the areas, and this is what we need to do. So we're going to take that back and tear it apart and dig deeper and, you know, put it to good use so that we will be a growth state. That's a very Jersey answer. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Born and bred. <laughs> yeah. So I, th I think that the this paired with other resources really and there's two examples I can think of real quick where things can be employed one you know in South Carolina state where the prevalent where the incidence of neonatal abstinence syndrome quadrupled in less than a decade and you look at 120,000 prescriptions a year being written to uh, being paid for by Medicaid uh, for women that are age 25 to 35 we, we shouldn't be surprised by that correlation right so so taking data about outcomes for children and then trying to articulate that in the root cause for the other provider behaviors we try to incentivize with this very large pot of money that we have is sort of one. The other is, um, you know, we contract predominantly with commercial insurers to administer the program. So our current um, contracts emphasize population-wide health. If on the average you can do good things, you can get kids immunized, um, you, you get bonus payments or, or get a withhold back. You know, the ability to, to modify that somewhat and say, 
we're not going to measure on the average anymore. We're going to expect that you display growth in closing racial disparity gaps or gender disparity gaps or geographic disparity gaps. I mean, it is important that government use its purchasing power to get the behavior it wants out of the people providing services. And we need the information necessary in, to or, in order to put those into the contracts and the programs that actually buy all this stuff. We have a few minutes. Uh, if anyone in the audience has a question, please no speeches, just questions. We can get a couple in. Uh, you first. So the question was just so uh, the audience can hear was about family resource centers and uh, someone wants to answer that sure. and maybe talk a little bit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The Bridgeport Prosper's approach, the baby bundle, aligns existing programs and resources in a strategy and a framework. Yes, they are on our radar. Um, a lot. Of, we can't throw away programs. What we can do is align programs and other initiatives because we're missing out on these opportunities. So yes, they are on board. Help me grow, they're there. Mom's initiative out of uh, New Haven, they're there. So we're, we're taking everyone we can to align to scale this statewide. It'll look different in different communities depending on what the resources are. Right, and in New Jersey, we do have family success centers. Uh, I think there's about 58 of them funded right now. Um, and our we have our Think Babies Coalition, um, which has representatives from all of our state departments, and the one that funds our Family Success Center does sit on our coalition, and they will be a part of all of our work that we'll be doing to improve outcomes for infants and toddlers. So definitely, yes, there are partners. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that we, I tend to be model agnostic when it comes to trying to reach out to families, right? So it is, it is not so much is this model good for this community, it is, it, it is that is, is the community receiving this thing? Is it accessing it? I mean, I don't, I'm not as big a fan, and which is not your question, but I'll answer this anyway, um, it is not to sort of parachute in support for a particular model, but really reach into the community and say, what is the, is, is it the Family Resource Center? Is it the um, pediatrician's office? Is it the, you, you know, are we, is it the school district? What is, what is the thing that appears to be connecting with families the best? And then let's try and channel um, access to resources through that thing. And so it's family resource center, great. Um, if it's not, also okay. Um, but, but let's just identify the thing in the community that's working instead of, um, and, and I think Myra said this the best, just have a big idea at the state level and then put one of those in every county and then hope it works out. Um, it, could, it usually doesn't. A gentleman over here. Uh, what is the role of Early Head Start in supporting infants and toddlers policies and infants and toddlers in your state? So that was a question about what the role of early Head Start was in these states. Sorry. Um, we have um, not enough early Head Start slots in our state, like in most states. Um, we do have five early Head Start child care partnerships. And I truly believe that approach of, of working with the um, community-based programs in, in their areas and providing them with the same amount of training and supports that they need to become a higher quality program is going to be essential in helping us move this forward. It will be the most cost-effective way, I think, for us to be able to bring those kind of resources to the community. Yeah, I, I think that... Um you know, South Carolina in particular has a, a, this is not an early head start or any fund source or program problem. It is a, it is a structural issue that the state has sort of dealt with in fits and starts. And that is, you know, we have a dozen health and child serving agencies and instrumentalities of the government that administer these different programs. Um, some of them are in the cabinet. Some of them are not. 
Um, at least two of them are quasi-governmental nonprofits. I'm on the board of one of them, and they all administer different grants and systems and programs. And I think that um, the the role of Early Head Start in South Carolina has largely been um, that that it sort of lives on its own and does its thing and is not fully integrated with anybody else in the system. In our 4K program, the public side and the private side are siloed and independent and don't really integrate with the rest of the system. So um, I, I think role is less important than what traditionally in South Carolina has been an absence of a cohesive strategy for um, infant and toddler development and the approaches to resourcing that. And so one of the reasons we got the baby net program is, is just a conversation we had with the governor of the state that said, you know, it's living out here on its own. If, if you want to give it a shot, integrate it with something else in a way that's, that's meaningful and rational. And I'm an executive branch guy, so we decided to put it in the cabinet. I mean, it just made sense to us. Um, to the extent that, that we can do that, I, I would like to see our Head Start and our Early Head Start programs better integrating with the other social service delivery systems that exist in the state. So, uh, any more questions? I think, oh, there was one more. I knew there was. Uh, I'm from Rhode Island. I'm from, um, Leanne Barrett from Rhode Island Kids Count. And I wonder if any of you guys wanted to talk about the importance of engaging families in pushing for change and the difference that it's made through Strolling Thunder that we've done in our states and the national Strolling Thunder. I know we have a, the chair of our HEW um, committee in Rhode Island said that he had got 25 phone calls when the post office moved a mailbox off a corner, and he's never had a parent call him and complain about childcare. Yeah, uh, I don't have a lot for you on that one. I mean, just, just to be frank. Um, so, so I guess the, it's, it's sort of, uh, is, is the question sort of more the impact of aging families is what you said, sorry. Engaging. Engaging families. All right. Um, Engaging families. I, I had, so I am, I am a father of three children um, that were born in a 14-month window. I was in graduate school when that happened, um, and, and uh, my uh, wife, who worked full-time, we took time off to hand the baby, there was no engaging us, right? <laughs> we, we were unengageable um, by outside forces, for, for a defined period of time. Um, I think part of this is just understanding that, that families are busy and, and, and you have to meet them where they are. And this goes back to the first question you asked, which is about advertising and, and promoting and community outreach. Where they are is they're in the pediatrician's office, right? They're with their family, they're engaged in their churches. And, and so, you know, we, we have to sort of understand, which is why this is important, what are they using and where are they? And can we reach them where they are? And there's so much. So there was a child fatality report that came out from a committee in the state. I, I've had it for two days. I haven't dug into it. I'm not going to quote it too much. But two of the things that, that really struck me in there uh, that had a disproportionate uh, share of child fatality were violence and safe sleep. And that feels like two things we can get right. Um, and, and so let's, let's put the violence piece aside and let's talk about safe sleep. I, like every other parent, sat in a chair and watched a video before I was allowed to take my baby home um, from the hospital about all of the things I was supposed to do as a parent. At that point, I hadn't slept in two days. Um, I was not paying attention. So I think one of the high touches with nurse family partnership and these other things is coming back around to the families, giving them the resources they need, really focusing on prevention, um, and, and not having these really great foster care programs because by then it's too late. Um, but, but just really try and meet them where they're at. Thank you guys uh, very much. Um, turn it back over to Myra for uh, the end here. You guys were amazing. I am so glad that you joined us. Thank you so much. This is where the innovation happens, right? Um, I want to thank Jan Jonathan for guiding us through this conversation through our program today. And thank you all for showing up for babies. This is not going to happen. We are not going to get every single state to grow without you. This is a partnership between the federal government, state government, advocates, parents. We are all in this because we have to be. We cannot squander the potential of a single child in this country. 
And so as you go back to your states, as you go back to your offices, I want you to have Diane's thoughts in mind. I want you, I want all of you who are a G or an R or an O to figure out how you're going to make yourself a W, how you're going to get to grow. And those of you who are grows, don't rest on your laurels. You have work to do because nobody is hitting it out of the ballpark on all of those indicators for babies. And so I am so, so proud. We have been doing this for over 40 years at zero to three. We have been relentless in our focus on infants and toddlers and their families. And it is such an honor to be able to partner with our great research partner in child trends and our, have our funders and have the support of our Think Baby States and all of you here because I know 30 years from now, we will look back and we will see that we have made a significant difference with this report, that this will be an annual way for us to check on the status of babies and toddlers and families and make sure that we are doing right by them so that we are doing right by our country. Thank you so much. Get out there, roll up your sleeves, and get to work. Thank you.